The Holy Bible, both old and new, speaks a lot about the kingdom of God. In fact, it begins from the Old Testament where we had the physical kingdom where God gave Israel kings to rule them. And eventually, John the Baptist came and in Matthew chapter three, he declared, repent for the kingdom of God is at hand. In Matthew chapter four, the Lord Jesus did the same. His message to the people were, repent for the kingdom of God is at hand. Later on, we found out that the kingdom that was being referred to by both John and Jesus how to do with the church that Christ was going to establish. So in Matthew 16, verse 18, when the Lord said, and I also say unto you that you are Peter and upon this rock I will build my church. We also have in verse 19, where the Lord said, and I will give you the keys of the kingdom. We are not arguing that every kingdom that is mentioned in the New Testament has to do with the church. We need to understand those contextually. But we have a number of passages in the New Testament that talk about the kingdom of God, which really have to do with the church that the Lord Jesus established. By his grace, all of us here are members of the church. We are citizens of that eternal kingdom. Now, how do we handle things in the kingdom? What is our understanding of being a citizen in the kingdom of God? being members of the Lord's church. What does that mean to you as an individual? So this morning, I would like us to examine some few passages from the New Testament that have to do with the kingdom of God. And as we ponder over these passages, let us keep in mind all the time that as kingdom people, the things that we allow God to do through us are more important than the things that happen to us. Let me repeat that. As kingdom people, the things that we allow our God to do through us are more important than the things that happen to us. Yeah. Things that happen to us in this world are not 100% palatable. In Job chapter 14, the Bible says, man who is born of woman is of few days, but full of troubles. Unfortunately, so many people have left Christ because of troubles, because of problems in this world, be it finances, be it marital issues, be it jobs, be it ailments, 
be it psychological problems, etc., etc. But these things are happening to us. And this morning, I am saying that when we allow God to work through us, that is more important than those things that happen to us. No condition is permanent, be it positive or negative. They cannot and they are not destined to be permanent. And therefore, when bad things happen to us, even when we are Christians, we should continue to be in the faith. We should continue to put our trust in the Lord, ask him for more faith so that we can endure. Because those things would not last. The worst thing that can happen to us is death. But here again, we do have life after death. Things don't end when we die. And therefore, kingdom matters should be special to kingdom people. People who have accepted the Lordship of Christ must always think about how best they can be used in this kingdom. That is the most important thing. The devil will come out with so many excuses. But the most important thing in life is being in the business of God's kingdom. So this morning, let us examine ourselves as individuals. How am I doing when it comes to kingdom matters? The Lord Jesus asked in Mark 8, what does it profit a man if he gains the entire world and loses his soul? That is very big and deep. Those who do not know Christ will not understand this. People think Material things are all that there is. People think we must live for the things we see. Forgetting the fact that every material thing is subject to material losses. And there will be a time that the things that we have the things that we spent all those years acquiring will not mean anything to us, but our soul. Kingdom matters. So it is not strange in Matthew 6, 33, when the Lord Jesus said, but seek first the kingdom of God and his righteousness and all these things shall be added to you. Sounds like one of the cheapest Bible passages. But how deep? Seek first. That is our struggle. We are unable to seek first. Prioritizing. Let your priority be on the kingdom of God. Has that not been the challenge for all of us? Are we able to understand this? Are we able to receive it? Are we able to apply it? Considering the kingdom of God and his righteousness first. That's a big thing for us as Christians. That's the big challenge. The devil would tempt us with so many things that will 
fight against this concept. The concept of we seeking first, putting priority on kingdom matters and goals, you see here, his righteousness, not our righteousness, his righteousness. What is right before God? What does God say? So the Christian's mission is to seek first. And the operative word is first. First, make the kingdom of God your priority. It is simple to hear what I've just read, but very hard to obey it. Seek ye first. No, I want to seek money first. Lord, you know, I need housing. Housing first. I need to take care of my kids' school fees first. So when we are confronted with using our resources to enhance the work of the kingdom, these are the things that militate against us. We choose to spend lots of our monies on ourselves, not on the kingdom, because we've not yet been able to make the kingdom our number one priority. But we are encouraged by the Lord Jesus here to do just that. The promise attached to this is that once we do that, once we seek first the kingdom of God and his righteousness, all these things shall be added unto us. Another trouble. Do we believe this? So this is faith matter. God is saying, when you seek my kingdom and my righteousness first, I, God, will add the rest to you. My question is, do we believe that? Superficially, we can say yes. But it's so hard for us. I keep telling fellow Christians that, you know, the things that challenge us most as Christians is not the book of Revelation, which is an apocalyptic literature. And therefore, there are so many concepts. There are so many things that we do not understand. And Christians keep on asking, what is the meaning of the red horse? What is the meaning of the pale horse? How about the black one? <laughs> the book of Revelation, the cryptic symbols scare us to death. But these are not the things that challenge us most. <laughs> that which challenges us most is that four letter word, faith. It's simple and easy to talk about faith. For us preachers and Bible teachers, simple to talk about faith. My brothers and sisters, faith is not cheap. It's not cheap. Simple to talk about it. Faith, in the Old Testament Habakkuk, Chapter 2 and verse 4, the prophet said, The just shall live by faith. And Paul the apostle would quote Habakkuk 2 in Romans chapter 1 and verse 17, when he says, The just shall live by faith. How strong is your faith? Your faith in the Lord. Proper definition for faith is trusting God and obeying him. That is the full definition for faith. 
trusting God. Some of the times we think just trusting God, hoping that God will do something is faith. No. Trusting God and obeying him. Because I trust him, I want to do what he says I should do. And by his grace, I am able to do it. That is faith. It makes me faithful Christian. A Christian who is full of faith. Faithfulness doesn't have necessarily to do with how good you are. No, that is misunderstanding. How we are better than the other man. Faithfulness doesn't have to do with that. Faithfulness simply means you are full of faith. And being full of faith means you keep on trusting your God and you try as much as possible to obey him. That makes you faithful. So as we think about the kingdom of God, the kingdom in which we are today, the kingdom that God has prepared for us. Let us always remember that God is asking us to put kingdom matters first. Let us make God's kingdom our priority. If we do not understand it today, and therefore we do not care about this, sooner or later, probably on our sick bed, we will regret not believing it. God's kingdom, the most important institution on earth. Unfortunately, the most misunderstood institution on earth. You talk about the kingdom of God and somebody thinks you are condemning him or her. You talk about God's kingdom and people think you are just being fanatical. But what constitutes a legitimate kingdom? We need a king. We need a territory. We need law or laws. And we need subjects. God's kingdom then is complete. Christ is our king. The territory is the whole world. And especially those who will obey the gospel of Christ. Who will receive Christ into their hearts. People who will prepare their hearts for him. My heart then becomes a territory for him. I become a subject, a servant, one who is willing to obey in his kingdom. And of course, in this Christian age, the New Testament being his law that governs me. The kingdom of God is complete. The biggest institution on earth. The most rewarding institution on earth. And we are privileged to have responded to that invitation to become members of his church, to become citizens of his kingdom. It affords us the opportunity to work and work and work and work for him. And yes, we can work for him in his kingdom. We work as if we are working, waiting for our juicy retirement in the future. So we wanna do all we can. Unfortunately, 
the tragedy has been most Christians do not fully understand this concept. And we just choose to become members of a congregation. As one preacher said, we choose to become pew warmers. We choose to be referred to as members of that church. And more or less, the church becomes like a social gathering for so many. Forgetting about the fact that God expects us to work and work and work and work because he is going to reward us. And the reward is sure. God's kingdom. In Colossians 1 and verse 13. Colossians 1 and verse 13. Paul in his writing said. He, God, has delivered us from the power of darkness and conveyed us into the kingdom of the son of his love. Now look at the work. Delivering us and conveying us. Think about those two words. He has delivered us. Think about delivering. Serving you. Serving you and I. And after that, conveying us to a new place. The Lord agreed to die in our stead. He agreed to be ridiculed. He agreed to be pierced into his side. He agreed to bleed so that we can be saved. And he did. And after that, those of us who have believed in the saving grace of the Lord Jesus, he says, I have now conveyed you to a new place. And Paul is saying here that he delivered us from the power of darkness. Power of darkness. All the saints in this world fall under the power of darkness. All the evil things we do against God fall under the power of darkness. And for a moment, let us think about millions of our friends our family members and our acquaintances who are still under the power of darkness. And the question is, do we care? The divine motive for establishing the church of Christ is not to have just a group enjoying themselves, but a group of people who will be on fire to do the work that God expects us to do. That mission, rescue mission, helping people to get out of the power of darkness. And of course, we will not do it unless we understand it. Look at the number of people who are under the influence of alcohol, of drugs, of sex, of money, 
of all the evil things that go on. The Lord Jesus said, Father, forgive them, for they do not know. Most of these people, they don't know. They don't know what they are doing. That is why we need to teach them. They might resist when we approach them. But what happens if the pilot in the air, after his final descent into an airport, is asked not to land, for there is something on the ground. What does he do? He goes around and wait for more information until he or she is permitted to land. When they reject us, must we stop? Why shouldn't we try all that we can to help rescue the millions of people. We have more than 7 billion human beings walking on the face of the earth today. And I dare say today, members of churches of Christ worldwide, we are less than 3 million. How do we account for the billions of people who have not yet heard the gospel? If we are not going to be kingdom-minded Christians, people who use all that they have, including their very lives, to help bring people into the kingdom of God. We know it. One of these days, we are going to die. We don't want to hear about that, but death is inevitable. There have been members who used to worship with us here who are no more. And the next decade, it might be us. People might be referring to us. He used to be an elder in this church. He used to be a deacon. He used to be a preacher. He used to be a member. How the devil deceives us to forget about the realities of life. I want to use all that I have to enhance kingdom business on earth. And if every Christian decides to do the same, the church of Christ would thrive. Today, churches of Christ have slowed down considerably. 50 years ago, we had missionaries and preachers of the gospel who were always on fire for the Lord. They loved God. They did their bits. How about today? We have slowed down. We are no longer a great force to reckon with, so to speak, again. We are not. We got millions of people who have never even heard of the name Church of Christ because we are not mentioning it to them. Kingdom matters. He delivered us from the power of darkness and he has translated us into the kingdom of his dear son. That is what the church is. Church is God's kingdom on earth. And we need to try to do all we can to let people know about this kingdom. In Matthew chapter 13, we have what we call kingdom similitudes. Kingdom similitudes. 
when you read from verse 24 to verse 30, that is Matthew chapter 13 from verse 24 to verse 30, the Lord Jesus talked about the kingdom of God like a man who sowed good seed in his farm. And when darkness came and people slept, then the enemy of this man came onto the field and began to sow tares amongst the wheat. So the time came for both the wheat and the tares to sprout out. They did. And the servants of this man went to the farm. And lo and behold, they did not only find wheat, they also found tars among the wheat. So they complained vehemently to the farm owner. We saw you sowing only wheat. How come we do have this back plant here? The response goes like, I know an enemy has done this. That was the response of the man. An enemy has done this. Pausing for a while. Gone were those days when preachers and missionaries of the churches of Christ, especially from the United States, were going into all the world talking about the church that Jesus built. Today, with so many preachers having lots of education in inverted commas, we are unable to preach about the church that Jesus built. We are unable to say that denominationalism is as a result of the work of an enemy. There is only one God. Christ is one. We have only one Bible. Why is it so strange to people to hear that there is only one church? The man sold wheat. And it was wheat. We call it wheat. It has a name. But the enemy came and sold tares amongst the wheat. And the man means no worse by saying, this is the handiwork of my enemy. And in the sermon I'll be talking about when the church sleeps, when we choose to sleep, negative things happen in the world. Don't blame the world because we chose to sleep. Stop complaining about the evil that is going on in this world because we have chosen to be in the sleeping mode. We are no longer as energetic as we used to be. We are not fulfilling our mission that we are supposed to. This morning, 
I just want to challenge all of us to review how we value the kingdom of God. How we factor kingdom matters in our important stuff in life. It should affect every facet of our life. God's kingdom. Denominationalism is not of God. Why have we stopped talking about that? Gross permissiveness has found its way into the churches of Christ. Liberalism has found its way into the churches of Christ. And therefore, we are unable to say the things we are supposed to say. In that same chapter, chapter 13 of Matthew, verse number 44, the Lord Jesus said, again, the kingdom of heaven is like treasure hidden in a field which a man found and hid. And for the joy over it, he goes and sells all that he has and buys that field. And I love the phrase, for the joy of it. You happy with the kingdom of God? For the joy of it. This man was looking for the most important treasure on earth. And when he found the most important one, for the joy of it, he sold all that he had in order to get that important treasure. Problem is, we've not been able to sell the other things. And therefore, we've not been able to get hold of that big treasure. In verse 45 of that same chapter, he talks about the pearl of great price. Same principle. This man was looking for the pearl, which was most priceless. He had bought some inferior ones. And when he found that pearl of great price, he sold all the inferior ones so that he could get the pearl of great price. Brothers, let me close by saying that we have found the pearl of great price. Let us cherish it. Let us give a deeper thought of that. And let us rededicate our lives to kingdom matters. God is counting on us. The church that he built. The church that he bought with his own blood. May he continue to bless us and help all churches of Christ around the world. That is what we are trying to do in Ghana, and Brother Harvey has been with us for so many years, encouraging us. I was like a kid when I began to work with Brother Harvey. And now today, by the grace of the Lord, the work is going on in Ghana. Let us continue to do what we can here in the United States and help wherever we can, just to see to it that the kingdom of God is being expanded. Thank you. Amen. 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 Amen.